Good morning, friends. It is indeed an honor to be with you again. All honor and glory is to God from whom all things, all our blessings flow. As is a common pair of practice, I'd like to start by honoring God by giving some praise for some people for whom I must give thanks. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge the president of our United Methodist men, Buddy Height. Buddy, where are you? Buddy is going to be coming to give a brief presentation to the bishop, but Buddy and his ministry also deserve our thanks and praise as well. Good morning. Good morning. Bishop Matthews and uh, members of the annual conference. Uh, I went to uh, Nashville to the National Association of Conference Presidents in March of this year, and I was presented with a certificate of appreciation that I wanted to present to Bishop Matthews this morning. It says, on behalf of the National Association of Conference Presidents of the United Methodist Men and the General Commission on United Methodist Men, we praise God for the faithfulness and stewardship of the Upper New York Annual Conference. Thank you for paying 100% of your World Service apportionments for year 2011. We have already acknowledged and celebrated the leader of our United Methodist Women, Pat Brigg, and we give thanks for her, her colleagues, our sisters in Christ, and their ministry as well. For Paul Sweet and Ann Malone, who lead our conference commission on youth ministries, I know they're sprinkled out there somewhere. <laughs> to a dear friend and sister in Christ, Carmen Viennese, who leads our conference Lay Servant Ministries. And to my truest sisters and brothers in Christ, our associate and district lay leaders, to Isla, Kristen, and Paul, would you please stand as our associates so we might celebrate you. To my sisters and brothers in the district lay leadership, please stand so that you might be acknowledged as well. For Cindy, Dawn, Brian, and all of those whose terms are ending, I cannot thank you enough for what you have contributed to the work of this group over time. Of course, there is a special place in my heart for our Episcopal leader, who has welcomed me as a genuine partner in ministry, whose words and actions continue to provide an example to which I can only aspire. And I do cherish the times we have spent together in leadership and fellowship. Thank you, Bishop. I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge another person who has become quite special and quite a friend to me, and that is our Director of Connectional Ministries. Bill and I have worked together a lot. <laughs> In fact, I bet if we sat down and added up the minutes, you and I have probably spent more time together than we spent with Jen and Dory this year. <laughs> and Bill indeed has become quite a brother in Christ to me and also welcomed me as an authentic partner in ministry and our time together I do indeed cherish. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, speaking of my wife, nothing is possible in my life without her love and support. And it is truly because she is as strong as she is and is as faithful as she is that I am able to serve you as I do. So I must give honor to my wife, Jennifer. Thank you. 
That said, would you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for this moment in time. Our hearts are open. Please move among us in a way that will indeed inspire us, move us, and draw us closer to you. We are your willing servants. Amen. Now, we have spent quite a bit of time talking about the parable of the sower, or however we're going to frame it this morning after Tiffany's exceptional refrain for us. And I have to admit, while this story has been very helpful and insightful to me in my own walk with Jesus Christ, it challenges me, and not for the reasons that were articulated so well this morning, but because you have to understand that I was born into a public housing project in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Everything was brick and concrete. About the only green I remember was the occasional graffiti tag and two very sickly trees that sat in these huge concrete planters in the middle of the court and green was a very rare occurrence on them. And there were these clumps of plants that looked, I would have to say, let me reframe that. I would doubt that those who planned the landscaping of Waring Court thought this was the desired outcome. <laughs> so when we left the court as a family, we lived in some rental properties that didn't have very much yard or green space around them. And my mother is also not a gardener, despite her many talents and gifts. That is not where her true passion lies. So as we as a conference have grappled with this theme of tilling soil and bearing fruit and harvesting, I have to admit, this is not my skill set. <laughs> and I am always impressed when I go past places and drive around and walk around and see these rather impressive yards and green spaces. And taking care of yards is really uh, an exceptional thing in Buffalo. That I live in a neighborhood that's part of the Garden Walk, and I am not on the Garden Walk. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's one of the things I love most about living in Buffalo, but it's also one of the things I hate most about living in Buffalo, because I am that guy. <laughs> in the neighborhood. And I just, it's not, it doesn't flow from me naturally. I know I have brothers and sisters in this room who are passionate gardeners. They produce wonderful things with their hands in the dirt and the soil, and that is great. And see me, I cannot find enough enterprising youth in my neighborhood <laughs> to which I might abdicate this responsibility. <laughs> And despite all my best efforts at rebudgeting, I cannot afford a lawn service. <laughs> and so, as I said, in many ways, I am that guy in my neighborhood. <laughs> but the lesson here remains every bit as profound for me. As we have discussed in many ways and as we have learned and discerned over the past few days, one of the challenges before us is that having come out of my experience where taking care of yard and garden was not really taught to me at a very early age or an expectation of me during the course of my formative years, the challenge for me now that I am a homeowner is that I don't have the option of not taking care of my space. The challenge for me as a homeowner is that this is a responsibility that comes with what I have chosen to accept. And friends, our message this morning is simple, that as disciples of Christ, 
tilling the ground for the harvest is not an option. It is a responsibility we have chosen to accept as part of our discipleship. We cannot keep trying to find those enterprising young neighborhood youth, and we cannot keep trying to find the landscaper who will do this for us. About three years ago, I had to recede a part of my yard. And I was debating whether or not I would do this myself with shovel. I quickly gave that up and went to Home Depot and got a hand tiller. And this was not a huge patch of land. Trust me, my friend Gordon, who actually deals with patches of land, would think, what are you talking about? Because I'm really only dealing with about a six by six space in my yard that needed to be receded because <laughs> the gas company had tore it up. <laughs> and so I was gonna plant new grass because there were brown patches there on purpose, but this rather considerable one <laughs> needed to be addressed. So I got the tiller and I started to till with it. And when I was done and had put that grass seed in the ground, the thought that went through my head was, thank God I didn't have to do that by hand. <laughs> but see, friends, this is also part of the point. Because there is work of discipleship that we as disciples really sometimes just don't want to do. That there is a challenge to being a follower of Christ that sometimes Christ will call us to that we simply don't want to do. And even though we gladly claim Christ, even though we gladly aspire to what's on the other side of that work, we would love to find that neighborhood kid or that lawn service that would be able to take on the responsibility or task we find less than desirable to perform. Friends, we do not have that luxury. That if we are going to see the harvest, then we must till. And this was driven home to me, in a way, by my lovely spouse not long after we moved into our current home. We were outside in the yard together, which by itself is probably a dangerous thing. <laughs> and so we're doing some work. And she looks over to me with this kind of furrowed brow and says, you know, you just gonna have to get dirty. <laughs> now, to put that into context, my back immediately went up, not only because of the source in the moment, but because I'm thinking, I get dirty. I mean, if I'm playing softball and I got a catch I got to make, I'll lay out and get dirty. If I'm playing a sport, and I need to run and make a tackle or get tackled, I'll get dirty. But as is often the case, Jen was right. <laughs> because she knew I was kind of dogging this. <laughs> because I just didn't want to get dirty doing that. <laughs> and she called me on it. That if we are going to do what we are here to do, you just gonna have to get dirty. <laughs> and friends, I don't think it's too much of a leap. Given the context we have shared, given what we have already heard, given what we know God is doing, given the reality of our church, to take this lesson and apply it to our current status. We're just gonna have to get dirty. <laughs> so, we must be willing to get dirty 
if we are going to produce the fruit that God expects from us. What does this mean in a practical sense? That we must engage in the work of producing vital disciples that comprise vital congregations in a vital connection so that we can make disciples for the transformation of the world. We will work to cultivate vital discipleship. At a recent meeting of our connectional table, noted church thinker Gil Rendell shared something with us about this notion of vital discipleship because he named a reality in the church which is a challenge for us. He said, are we inviting people into a lifestyle that we are not ourselves living? You know, the world is very savvy about the hypocrisy of Christians. <laughs> that it's not hard to find someone who is not walking their talk. And if folk cannot see in us a life transformed by prayer, by study, by growth, by service, who wants what we're selling? <laughs> Vital discipleship comes from engaging in those practices. And if we are only paying lip service to prayer, if we are only worshiping when it is convenient, if we are only growing when we can fit it in around all the other things we find more fun, and if we are only serving when we can work it in among all of the other obligations we consider more important, why should we not be surprised that the fruit we seek is less than vital? Friends, as disciples of Christ, lay and clergy, vital discipleship is the start of this for us. We cannot concentrate on vital congregations because vital congregations start with vital disciples. And if we are going to do the hard work as individuals, don't make this about what you know everybody else isn't doing. Are you willing to, as we were invited last night, to turn over the soil of your own soul? Are you willing to unpack the rocks? Are you willing to nurture and care for those pieces of you where you know God hopes more might grow? Because if we are not willing to get dirty around that, let us not be surprised that our yard looks like it does. We must be willing to get dirty in the work of building vital congregations. Now, I know this is a buzzword, and as our friends in the communication team shared with all of you last week in an e-advocate, I've bought into this vitality thing. Mm -hmm. And I have because in talking about all of these yards and beautiful green spaces that I'm able to enjoy as I walk through my neighborhood, the key thing here is, you know how the Miracle Grow commercial works? Where they put what looks like a pretty nice and healthy plant down in front of you and they go, this is your regular result. <laughs> and then they'll put the Miracle Grow plant over here and it'll be that much bigger. <laughs> Friends, we can do good work and we can produce fruit. But imagine if, now, chemical enhancement aside, what if we went not only to Miracle Grow, but the source of all true miracles to see how we might be different? When we think about the fruit we seek to produce, that's what we're after. We can be on cruise control as congregations. 
and we can function, and we can have the programs, and we can do the things. But to be vital captures some of those intangibles that we can feel or discern when we're in their midst, even if we cannot capture them in metrics. It represents that growing, dynamic, spirit-filled, loved-filled community to which we all aspire. And those communities naturally produce fruit. And it's not simply about functionality. It is about vitality. And if we are going to go there, see, the odd part is that even miracle Grow must be applied. We have to go out into the yard and get dirt. Lastly, we will get dirty in the work of strengthening a vital connection. You know, in all of this conversation around vital congregations, I think we have lost a, an important dimension of who we are. Those of you who know me well know that I've said, I do in fact get the vital congregations thing. I was on the call to action team. I helped put it together. I get it. However, the idea that a vital congregation is the primary locus where the mission of the church is lived out and disciples are made does not mean we abandon our connection that as we heard routinely, repeatedly, and accurately this morning, we need each other. We need each other. So when we start to think that, well, we can enclose in on ourselves that the conference, the district, the others in our midst are no longer necessary to help us be who God has made us to be. When we start to think that certain decisions or certain practices or polity do not reflect what we in this community may not feel, then we can simply disengage from the practices of our denomination or our connection. When we start to think that we can handle this on our own because we are not getting what we want from that great amorphous them over there in Syracuse. We start to cut ourselves off from the vine. And I think Jesus was clear what happens when we disconnect from the vine. Friends, a vital connection is crucial to being able to accomplish certain hopes and dreams of our God in this time and in this place. It does not contradict the adaptive challenge to suggest that we will redirect more of our energy and resources to local churches to continue to work at maintaining how we might do more together. The very idea of a connectional ministry means that we as disciples connect to each other. We can do more together than we can alone. As we go forward, my hope and my energy will go into working on those contributions of laity to this vitality. One of the things we have learned is that when we look at the vitality of our connection and our congregations, we know that certain practices by all of our disciples make a difference. It starts with those pieces of vital discipleship we've named, which is laity who contribute in vital congregations know that they have and must demonstrate vital personal faith, as we have articulated it earlier. They are engaged in regular prayer, worship, growth practices, and service. Secondly, vital churches focus on increasing the effectiveness of their lay leadership and all of the disciples present. 
people understand the contributions they make. They serve out of their gifting, and they are partnered with clergy to help them make that ministry more effective. Churches call, equip, and use more of the laity in their midst to spread the work that must be done and to start new work so that the fruit can happen. That when left to a closed off few, we start to burn out and we start to separate. And those who disengage rarely bear fruit. And we do offer opportunities for newer, younger, different people to step into leadership roles so that we are moving forward and that the idea of power is not held in an isolated few, but actually the work of the church is indeed the work of the church. So friends, let me be as clear as I can possibly be. The challenge in front of us will only be met when we are willing to get dirty for God. We must embrace the unpleasant and uncomfortable work of our own souls, our local churches, and the ministry in our mission fields. There are no gimmicks. There is no out that all who embrace the call of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ are in fact called to his service. So as we go forward from here today, let us know that the blooming garden or the overflowing basket of fruit that we seek will only come when we are willing to get down in the dirt and till. Know that we will see the harvest if we do the dirty work at the beginning. While we may hate that dirty work sometimes, it is absolutely essential to what we are called to be and it cannot be avoided. It is absolutely necessary. God continues to work and bless and mold us into the people God hopes we might become through these experiences. It is such a blessing that God chooses to use us at all. This is a perfect and almighty and eternal God who can accomplish whatever God wants. God doesn't need us to do God's work. God chooses to bless us through God's work. How then do we as God's disciples decide we will abdicate that? Friends, we are called to till until we shall. We are going to get dirty because our God is worth getting dirty for. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.